So starting off with this problem, 40, page 358. So we're to find uh, the tension in the string and the components of this reaction force, um, you know, right at the pivot. Uh, we're introduced to that in that one example in chapter 12, but uh, there's no other allusion to it um, previously in that chapter. So we you have to make sure that we're treating it properly. Um, the boom is 1200 Newtons. Uh, its weight is gonna be concentrated at the center of mass here. The weight here is at the extreme edge of the, of the boom of length L. And the tension is at three quarters of the length. So that's the red. So find T, R, X, R, Y, magnitude of R and the direction theta R. So just to dissect this. Step one, let's always make sure we have the proper perspective. One second here. Okay, so for all cases, the, re, um, the reaction force is gonna have components along the common X and Y axis, like so. They're not gonna be uh, necessarily the cosine and sine of 65 or whatever this angle is, unless it's told to you as in the example in chapter 12, but um, more than likely uh, is gonna be another angle. So let's see what that is. Um, so why this perspective? Because as mentioned, Rx and Ry point in these directions. That's that's where you always, this is your baseline. Like I was saying last class, the Rx and Ry are your baseline. That's your perspective. That is your X and Y. So let's get all the forces along the X axis. Rx is going to equal um, some force going the other way. Remember, remember this whole system. This whole system is in balance. So we have to get um, at least two or more forces in both directions. Uh, so there was a question even pertaining to the skills test or <clears throat> skills test or the example question, is Rx going to be zero? I mean, there, what component? I can't find another force for Rx. Well, in order for the system to be balanced in all directions, there has to be another force, um, at least two equal and opposite to add to zero. Our job is to find it. Um, so Rx, Ry, um, basically same thing as X and Y. Same thing as that. So the second step, our free body diagrams as usual. So we have forces and we have torques because we have a rotation point. We have a, you know, a pivot by which all those forces are gonna be, you know, rotating around. So there's forces and torques. <clears throat> One second here. Sorry, my Zoom keeps lagging. Can you uh, scroll up for just a second, please? Yeah, mine is having a little issue. But that. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. Here or. Yeah, yeah. that's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully, I didn't get. To, I don't get timed out. It hasn't happened in a long time, so hopefully, it, uh, that keeps going. So let's draw a big picture here for my FBDs. My um, weight of uh, 
2,000 newtons points down. Uh, center of mass or center of gravity for the boom. Twelve hundred newtons, and then about three. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So we're back. Okay, so I was saying the weight is 2,000 newtons is at the um, at the farthest end of the boom. Uh, the boom center of uh, the weight is, is concentrated at the center of gravity here, 1,200 newtons. And we have the tension just three quarters of the way up the boom. So we have a negative Tx there or Tx going that way. Um, and this angle in there is 25. So we have Rx and Ry. So like I was saying, either Rx is always going to be equal to something, as you can see here, that this is T. T cosine theta, 25, T sine theta, 25, right? So we have our forces in the X and Y direction, R, X, R, Y, good data. So let's write those, um, those force equations up. Everything in the X axis and the Y. So we have Rx minus uh, T cosine 25 equals zero for balance. Okay, that's a negative x-axis, positive x-axis, positive y-axis, negative y, negative y, positive y. So, Ry plus, and both of those, I'm just going to add them together, 2,000 and 1,200. 200 newtons. Okay, so we have two unknowns here, so we can't do anything yet. We also have a net torque equation. This is basically my third step or included here. So the torques are going to be a result of all the forces. And let's see if there are torques um, produced by those forces. So we have a, a force from the, uh, from the pivot, the reaction force. We have a force, or I say a torque from the boom, force over a distance, possibly a torque from the weight itself, and the string. Well, the reaction force is at the pivot, so the distance for that force is zero, so there's no torque. That goes away. And then we can see the torque from the boom is going to cause a uh, clockwise torque. If we isolate this force and let it rotate, it's going to you know, rotate in a clockwise fashion, you know, like that. Same thing for the 2000 clockwise, and that's going to be negative torques. So now how to deal with this string? Because even, uh, even Nicole asked or said that, you know, I think one question the last time, this T cosine theta is not perpendicular. Well, correct, and then based on the problem I gave, the 35, for that, for that issue, um, it worked. You know, because I didn't, I, I didn't give you anything else for that problem. But let's do a real, more realistic problem here. 
So it's T cosine theta. We know it's gonna be some distance away uh, from the pivot. So how do we deal with that? What is, what, it, how can we make that perpendicular or is there no, something else that we have to do to see if, or to see how T cosine theta and even T sine theta produces a torque? Because right now nothing's perpendicular. Well, so if we um, draw the picture out a little bit, a little bit better here. I still my green. Um, this length of the boom L at 65 degrees, you know, has components to it, or we can we can look at the part of L that could be perpendicular to both T sine and T cosine. Not interested in the final answer, Sin. <laughs> we'll get there. But your enthusiasm is uh, appreciated. Okay, um, T cosine theta. So we have, um, so there's our, our tension right there. This is length L. This will be L sine of uh, 65. L cosine of 65. It's L sine of 65 that's perpendicular to T cosine 25. So we have to look at the part of L that is perpendicular to that force that has a distance from the pivot. That's how we resolve that. So if we wanted to extend this even further, so this will be T cosine here. This T cosine 25 is perpendicular to L sine 65. That's the torque produced by T cosine 25. And then likewise, extend this out here. If I may say that this whole component here, you can idealize that as T sine 25, that's gonna be perpendicular to L cosine 65. Does everybody see that? And that's T. So that's a little bit of the intricacies of this type of problem that relates directly to the uh, skills test and problems of this type. So that's that's why if we let if we just looked at T sine twenty five, it's going to rotate counterclockwise. It's going to cause this boom to go this way. T sine 25 is going to cause a counterclockwise torque. T cosine 25 is also going to cause a counterclockwise torque because if you can imagine T, T cosine 25 right there, is if you pull it, it's going to cause the boom to rotate um, counterclockwise. Unit circle. And those are our torques. We have the boom, we have the weight, that's easy. And the string, that's, what, that's how we have to deal with that. Um, so then just writing up the, to uh, the uh, torque equations or the expressions. I'm gonna have positive T cosine 25, that's the force, and the radius would be three quarters of the length R L sine of 65. The part of R that is perpendicular to T cosine 25 is this. And then T sine 25 times 
three quarters L cosine 65, and then the other ones are the easy ones. 1200 for the um, weight of the boom. Cosine 65 times L over two. Let me not be remiss on that one. If I would draw a another picture for the the torque by the boom and the weight, do something like this. So we have that is the twelve hundred. The part of the the part of this weight that's perpendicular to the boom is the cosine component. So that's why it's going to be twelve hundred cosine 65 and the distance is L over two, half the length. 1200 cos 65, and we know this back in chapter, going back to chapter um, uh, five, that this is gonna be 65 and this is 65 here. And likewise up top, this weight, that's gonna be, Two thousand cosine of sixty-five times L because it's at the the end of the boom. So, and those are going to cause clockwise torques. If you look at twelve hundred, it's going to you know spin it. Like I said in the last picture here. Uh, this this uh, force would cause a clockwise torque and likewise over here, clockwise. And uh, let's see, did, did it. That's gonna be 2000 cosine of 65 times L equals zero. Now, if you just uh, solving for T, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put all this stuff here on the right-hand side, and all the my T's on the left and factor and all that. So cosine 25 times three quarters, sine 65, Well, nothing actually made you make those components, but if you're looking at L as it rotates, at some point it's gonna be horizontal and at some points it's gonna be vertical. But at this point, it has both components at once. So you're looking at the components that are gonna, that are gonna be um, perpendicular to the cosine and the sine. Another way you can um, be comfortable with that idea is that this L has mass. And so there's a force due to gravity on that mass, which you can treat in terms of components in this orientation. And that's kind of why we can do that. Okay, so then This becomes sine of 25, three quarters, cosine of 65. And that just equals all the stuff over there. <clears throat> I move the 1200 stuff on the right. So 1200 becomes positive, cosine 65 and times one half. You'll notice that I wiped out the L's because L occurs everywhere on both sides. So L's go away. And that's plus 2000 
cosine of 65. The question. You can try that if you if you wish, but there's more than one way to skin a cat, all right? So as long as you're keeping consistent, whatever you choose to do, make sure that your force is perpendicular to a particular distance. Go be happy. <laughs> so that's, there's, there's not one, only one way to do this. Try to show an easy way. Okay, so therefore, when you do all that math, I'm not. I'm gonna cut out the middleman on that. You can, you can do that yourself. But this stuff in parentheses becomes 0.748, and the right hand side becomes 254. 845.2, 1200 cosine 65 divided by two is 254, 2000 cosine 65 is 845.2, and that, and you divide it by 0.748, so T becomes roughly 1469 newtons. Okay, that's my tension, and then go back to my forces equation to get my Rx and my Ry which is another thing I need to do, and then I get the magnitude and I get the direction and done. So, Rx minus T cosine of 25. And then Rx right away, well, Rx is going to be 1469 cosine of 25. That's roughly 1331 newtons. Ry is going to be 1469. So all I'm doing is I'm putting all this stuff on the right-hand side. So 1469. Um, Sine of 25, that becomes negative now. And this becomes plus 3,200. I added that, so 1469. This is going to be a negative 620 plus 3,200, 2,580. So Ry is that, Rx is 1331, magnitude and direction is easy. So. You can just plug your guys in there. I'm just gonna cut that out. And that becomes 4,045 newtons. Angle theta, inverse tan. And then that just becomes uh, the 2580. by 1331. Um, roughly 63 degrees, so almost a 65, but again, you know, there's going to be many problems where that, don't be misled by that angle theta, the 65 at the bottom, that's not going to be, you know, your Rx and Ry, it's something that was, you probably inferred it, I don't know, but it wasn't directly explained in the text. And I just wanted to draw that out. So 
So again, just always go in terms of Rx, Ry, not unless it's explicitly told as in that example. We had the guy on the boom, you know, the example in your textbook, 12.2, where it was gonna be R cosine 53 and R sine 53, not in all cases. Uh, any questions, anything you need to see? Okay, so that's the, that's the basic rub. Take this, make up your skills test too, or you wanna redo it. Because most people who, you know, I mean, you basically did it, you, you got the, if it's the order of magnitude, 10 to the fifth, you know, like some 100,000, 200,000, some people got like 400,000, I gave it to you because the, mag, the order of magnitude was fine. But you can get it cleaner if you, you know, do this. Okay. The well, next thing we're going to talk about, we're going to go back to section um, 10.4. So go back to your textbooks there. And we're going to talk about rotational kinetic energy. We know what linear kinetic energy is about. Linear kinetic energy is the motion of a particle. But rotational kinetic energy is going to be the kinetic energy of a distribution of particles. Basically, what we call moment of inertia, distribution of many particles versus one particle, distribution of mass about some rotation point. Imagine a wheel. It has linear kinetic energy because it, it rolls forward and it also rotates. So it has both. And that's something that's going to be very important when we do a future question, uh, test question, um, where I have a, a roller coaster and I have a, like a, a marble or a, a hollow wooden ball. And you have to get like the speed at the bottom, or you have to you have to do the rotational kinetic energy, as it, as all of that mass spins around an axis, and it also rolls down the hill. So it has linear and rotational. Okay. So, let's see if I can summarize and do the same thing. So we have a particle moving along, speed v, we know its kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Now you can imagine if you put a microscope on this particle, as you get closer, it's gonna widen up. And that's basically the situation of a wheel. Or you can take this particle and connect it with other particles in series until you get a spherically symmetric wheel, sphere or whatever. All right, so now with a wheel, let's say that this point is right there. And we have a wheel where all this matter is distributed about this axis. We are gonna look at all the particles on the outside here rotating with some speed V. Okay, it's gonna rotate and have a linear speed. So it's gonna roll forward and rotate. The particles on the outside are responsible or are the reason, if you will, for the rotational kinetic energy and the, and the axis of rotation or the center of mass, which is the axis of rotation in this case, is gonna be moseying along at a linear speed. So you're gonna have, in the case of a wheel bobbing along, Linear kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy. So let's say that we have, so any one of these particles in circular motion, um, experiences kinetic energy I'm just taking a look at any one of these. So this is a VT for this guy, VT for that, whatever. I'm just taking one. 
And I'll say the kinetic energy, the linear kinetic energy on the outside would be one half mass VT squared for the tangential velocity. We know from first principles, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 10, that the translational velocity around a circle, something that spins, is married to its angular velocity about the middle by this equation Vt equals r omega. So I'm going to make a substitution for Vt here. And that becomes 1 half m r omega squared. And expanding this out. So this would be the kinetic energy of any particle on the outside of the wheel. Now, since this wheel is made up of many particles, you can, you can say, so this is gonna be like the kinetic energy of each particle on the outside. Since the wheel is made up of many particles, we're going to collect all of those particles as they rotate. And this equation then becomes, since we're looking at all of the particles that make up all the, that make up the wheel that is not at the center, that are not at the center, every particle that's not at the center of mass are going to be rotating. And there's many of them. So we sum them together, integrate whatever, we sum them together. And then this becomes one half sum mr squared omega squared. So I'm, I'm summing all of these particles with respect to the rotation point and all of their individual radii. This term in here is what is called the moment of inertia. I like to call it the distribution of mass from a pivot or axis of rotation. Different shapes have different geometries. And so therefore, well, like you have a sphere, nice and smooth, symmetric, mass is distributed all nice and neat. And if you have a pear-shaped object, it's gonna have a particular geometry, a particular, um, um, particular distribution of mass, if you will. A cylinder has its own distribution of mass, a rod, all different shapes. There's linear distribution, there's area distributions, there's volume distributions of mass. The sphere would be a volume and rod is linear and sheet of paper, area. So depending on the shape, depending on the, ge ge depending on the geometry, you're gonna get a different moment of inertia. Circles have moment of inertia of mr squared, let's say. Just put it on the shelf. Spheres, two-fifths mr squared. Rods, one-twelfth or one-third, depending on where you're spinning it from. So depending on where you're spinning the object from, its moment of inertia will be whatever it is. If the rod, if you're spinning a rod at the center, the moment of inertia will be one-third mr squared. There's a table of moments of inertia. You can go check that out. Now, if you spin it someplace else that's not at the center of mass, then this moment of inertia shifts. The way you're looking at the object uh, in all of its mass uh, um, uh, and, and the way that the mass is distributed now changes. So the moment of inertia changes. It becomes 1 12th mr squared or some craziness like that. So depending on where you're spinning the object from, you're going to get different moments of inertia. So this I, moment of inertia, or I like to call it distribution of point particles, distribution of particles, because for many years, if you will, all last semester, we dealt with one particle. Now we're de dealing with the distribution and it's rotating about a, a particular point or distribution of And 
they, they, they all have uniform mass. It's not a conglomerate. It's all made up the same stuff. So, all right. <clears throat> so then, this rotational kinetic energy becomes one half i omega squared, where m r squared is i moment of inertia, and that's our rotational kinetic energy term. Okay. Oops. Any questions on that? It looks similar to m v squared. Where now we're not dealing with just a point ma uh, point particle m. We're dealing with a distribution i. We're not dealing with a linear velocity, but an angular velocity because it's rotating. Other than that, looks very much the same. And so when we do conservation of energy, we're gonna be uh, dealing with both kinetic energy terms and potential energy, MGH, because all of that matter, mat, mass, we can, we can idealize it at the center. It's gonna be falling from uh, some initial height to zero, or some final height. So it's gonna be the MGH, that doesn't change, but the kinetic energy terms, uh, there's an additional kinetic energy term. Okay, so let's look at an example, 10.3. Example 10.3, page 277. Be comfortable with this moment of inertia thing. Four tiny spheres are fastened to the ends of two rods of negligible, ma negligible mass lying in the XY plane. We shall assume the radii of the spheres are small compared with the dimensions of the rod, so the distance from the spinning point. If the system rotates about the Y axis with an angular speed omega, find the moment of inertia and the rotational kinetic energy of the system about this axis. So when we're trying to find the moment of inertia, we have to figure out about which axis is the spin. At that point, we know that the moment of inertia is gonna be zero because that's the point of the spin, r is equal to zero. So we look at all the other masses that spin with respect to that axis. They are gonna have distances, therefore they're gonna have moments of inertia, mr squared, omega squared, you're done. So if it's spinning about the y-axis, we're gonna get, all the masses are gonna be horizontal, a horizontal circle. If it's about the x-axis, it's gonna be a vertical circle. Z-axis is, everything is gonna be rotating like an X, as we see in the, in the second picture here. Pretty much it. And cool thing about the moment of inertia about the Z-axis is just the sum of everything about Y and X. So anyway, um, this is, uh, find, uh, find the moment of inertia about the y-axis. Okay, so, so the y-axis, the picture is, the, the first picture of the guys is twirling. Because that's the y-axis and everything is, so do that. So, um, so we have this action like that. So these guys here and so we have a so you can see that in your in your text. 
This is distance A. And of course, these will be B, but they, they don't matter because we're looking at how the matter, how the masses are distributed about the Y axis, then the X axis, then the Z axis. The Z axis is the axis that comes out of the page. That's why the whole thing's gonna spin as one. How do both simultaneously look? Uh, how does the mass distribution simultaneously look with respect to the Z? So, here we go. All right, so let's see. Technically, I should have wrote the MI because it's many point masses, but that's what the I indicates. Many point masses and all of their individual radii. In this case, we just have two. M A squared and M A squared. Two M A squared. Likewise for X would be two M B squared. So that looks like this. We have a <laughs> into the page. Can't really do that one. It's twirling, yeah. The, the horizontal axis is twirling. Okay, so then we have uh, little m. So, I Z is just the sum. It's just questions. Distribution of mass. Now find the uh, kinetic energy about the z-axis, or about the y-axis, okay? So we just take this moment of inertia term and do the arbitrary omega and we're done. Ma squared omega. Omega squared. So that becomes M A squared Omega squared. And then I go on to do the other thing, my you know, Z axis and stuff. Okay, so that's just a bit on that. I'm gonna skip 10.5 for now. Um, we may get to it in the uh, additional topics after spring break. I don't see um, too many times where we have to do integration of uh, uh, calculating moments of, uh, of inertia by integration, but we'll see if we have time for that. So it's 10.5, we're gonna skip over. Um, one thing I, I, I'd rather... Just before I get to uh, 10.7, because 10.6, we've talked about torque. We know the definition of torque. So we're gonna go to 10.7, but briefly, uh, I wanna talk about this deal called the parallel axis theorem. And I'm specifically looking on page 281. And I'll leave you alone after this. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop now. Uh, I'll give you an example. Yeah, why don't we just, just hold off on that? I don't do too much. 
you more time yourself. So I want you guys right now, let's go to page 301. And do an example of this uh, moment of inertia stuff. So. So why don't you do number 21? Let's take five or so minutes. Just again, you set this up, Ix is going to be each mass and its distance away from the rotation axis. In this case, it's x. So three is gonna be three meters away from the x-axis. This two here is three meters away. This four here is three meters away and the two will be three. So for that whole spin. And then uh, I cancel two. Multiples there. Uh, and then just setting up this guy. So I, Y, now the system is going to be uh, rotating horizontally. It's going to be going, if you will, clockwise into and out of the page. If the clock is above the, above the Y axis. Um, It doesn't really matter. I think clockwise or counterclockwise, but it's about the y-axis. Uh, okay, so then in that case, for i y, it'd be three and two, two and two, four and two, two and two. All right. So three and two squared. And that's uh, two again. And once you get all, get all those guys, it's IZ is just going to be the sum. And then you want to get the rotational kinetic energy about the Z axis. And you have omega, which is six radians per second. And that's it. Okay, that'll do it for today. And I'll see you again tomorrow. We'll go over this in detail. And I'll see the rest of you at say 2.35 for skill sets, makeups and all that. We're gonna clear up that confusion. Okay. All right, one second.